Hi, welcome. We're going to get started. I'm Kyle DeCuyen. I'm the executive director of the Poetry Project. It's great to be seeing all of you in this room together. This is the first indoor, in-person event I'm hosting at the Poetry Project since February of 2020. Um, so I was saying, yeah. So welcome back. And thank you so much for cooperating with so much care with our safety practices. Um, we really appreciate everyone kind of joining with us and making this space and making this as safe a space as, um, as we can have at this moment. Um, we do ask that you continue to wear your masks indoors. Thank you, everyone, for observing that. Um, we're going to have tonight's reading with no break in between. Uh, Joseph Kaplan will read. I'll come back on and introduce Michael Gottlieb. And that's partly because we have an audience of folks joining us on a live stream. Thank you to everyone on the live stream. Um, but if you do need to take a break at some point during the reading, um, feel free to leave through the doors. The restrooms are just up the stairs. Anyone who needs a ground level accessible restroom, let us know, anyone working at the desk, and we can help you get there. Um, it's great to be back in this space where we have been presenting work since 1966. Uh, the Poetry Project is committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in this space. And as part of that, we would like to begin our evening by acknowledging that this venue is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the U.S. and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgments can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. And I'm going to begin setting up our reading. Um, I've been reading this week, and I imagine some other folks in this room have been reading this uh, long-form New York Times piece, Bad Art Friend. Uh, and it's, a, it's like a 6,000-word piece on um, a rivalry between two fiction writers that I found kind of horrifying and mundane and provocative. Um, it's a story about narcissism and appropriation and recognition. And reading it, I was sometimes wondering, like, what is the premise of this? Is the premise solipsistic? Or who... What, what, what would anyone who lives outside the social sphere of writing and writing fiction get from this? And while I was reading it, I was thinking about tonight's event, um, and that's partly because I think in different ways, and this is not to put too fine a perimeter around Joseph Kaplan's and Michael Gottlieb's work, I think in different ways, both of them are poets who ask this question of what makes a bad art friend or what makes a good art friend? Or how do all of these vectors that seem not art or not necessarily art, friendship, antagonism, admiration, nepotism, revenge, how do all of these forces conspire with art to form and unform culture? Uh, it's sort of Darwinian, um, and we are in it. We inherit it, and it will be the trace or the disappearance of us. In one of the introductory notes for his selected, Michael Gottlieb writes, I'm someone who makes work out of language that doesn't belong in poems, which just feels to me like such a perfect, expansive observation for both Gottlieb and Joseph Kaplan, whose work I'm going to introduce first and whose newest book, Out From Make Now, is titled Loser. Loser is bifurcated with crying and begging, two sequences careening between the obsequious and the authoritative. I think the voice in this work is bringing us down into the well and posing what consciousness there is, not just in pain, suffering, wounding, and loss, but more specifically in losing and the catastrophes of defeat. 
The loser is a holy fool, hell-bent on clarity, fearless in articulating the material terms of struggle. At times, in this and other work, poem without suffering, democracy is not for the people, this seemingly very sincere voice leads us somewhere volatile or shows us the precarity and seams of where we were all along. You feel the work in voice in time the way you do a manifesto. And now we get just that tonight, a feast. It's a great pleasure to welcome Joseph Kaplan to the Poetry Project. <clears throat> thank you, Kyle. And thank you, everyone at the Poetry Project. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to everyone who came. This is, I mean, this is, uh, this is really intense and exciting for me to be reading. So I just want to uh, probably just need to like breathe. I don't like pass out. Uh, so as Kyle said, this is, um, I'm just going to read from Loser mechanics of it it's a you know it's a book um in two parts uh two monologues and um i'm going to read a little bit <clears throat> from both this is um crying it's over we lost and now we're going to get it we're going to get it so bad we're so fucked we're doomed i mean we're done that's it it's only a matter of time at this point. We're just waiting for them to find us, to clean us all up, to bulldoze us entirely, drive us down finally into the mud with everything else, everything else that got drawn into the fray and smashed into little shards. It's hardly even worth it at this point to belabor the obvious with elaborate analytical reminiscences or to mourn or sob or whine to indulge in self-pity and depressive hopelessness. There's probably no reason at all at this point to shed even the smallest single tear knowing now what we do, as if our end had ever been anything other than sure, as if our defeat could ever be imagined alongside even the slightest pretense of ambiguity, some dangled joke of its uncertainty so that victory might live in the slimmest margin of the possible, crouched and ready for some miracle. That's not the case. That is not our situation. We never even had a chance. Not one. We were always just screwed. It wasn't even close. It wasn't even a contest. They just rode over us. They crushed us like bugs. They pulverized us, pounding down on us until we were nothing, effortlessly. There's no other way to put it. It was a catastrophe, plain and simple, an utter, utter disaster. There's nothing redemptive about it. No speck of comfort to glean, no lessons to appreciate, nor ghostly whiff of optimism to elaborate upon later, one day, at some other time, in some other place, some lovely, warm place, some soft retreat fit for reflection where we might recline all together in a big sweet pile and think back on what we could have done differently and luxuriate in the dream of future successes brought closer to realization through this keen observance of our past follies. Because we lost, I mean, we lost for real in the worst way and so nothing else matters now. Everything we cared about is gone. All of our plans, all of those years of preparation, of self-improvement, of practice and experimentation and inquiry and research into how best to cooperate and empower and effectuate ourselves, all of that work sharpening our lives with debate, with critique and constant passionate scrutiny, that's all dead and gone. 
all of those years when every article we wrote, every letter, every book or treatise arrived with the weight of fearsome purpose, each an entry into our growing bank of shared revelations, our eyes opened afresh each time to the immediacy of our mission. Every talk or speech felt as if shouted, thunderous, blasting at the most extraordinary decibels into the gray faces of our rivals. Every conversation held late into the night, all of us hunched over the kitchen table or gathered together at the back of the bar, foregoing sleep and food and whatever else to be together just a little bit longer, to talk and feel each other close and affirm it in hushed voices, hands moving to more emphatically map a point, cigarettes burning down, laughing, mirthful, as we casually lean back to take another long sip of beer or wine or tequila or whiskey, cracking our knuckles, letting the sun slink up over the street an hour before work, before we had to sit ourselves down and count out time at a desk or register or console, that indignity forgotten for a second within the cleave of this meeting, as if we were in that moment angled away from the reckoning we face now and towards some other ascendant future, wrestling it into ourselves, something promised, a condition untested but made whole and actual in small visions. All of that, all of those moments, useless now, seem drained of their vigor and quickly fading. With each of us, they tear out of hiding alone or in packs, from holes frightened, huddling, or from behind a false wall, or from under a floor, in some closet, or out from deep in the hills, once shrouded by woods, now burnt and shorn down to nothing, along with everything else, everything we've witnessed, every written account or recording, every artifact of our having lived and mattered, they will pluck it out. Each and every trace of us, they will dig up from the earth and erase. It will be as if we had never existed, like a length of history that has been drawn out, a stray hair rolled into a tiny ball and thrown underfoot, and all other intimations of threads unfurling past the backwards glance of this end, evaporating into silence, cut out of any official record, obviously, but also cut out from all the common memories left among people, fantasies and jokes, dreams and predictions of the ways lives might turn, the way variables might break, and the choices required to realize these ruptures, to hasten them. They'll be gone. No chances left to be redeemed. No world will bear our mark not even in the obverse, where defeat makes possible the shape of whatever triumphant present remains, affecting it in the negative as the underside of its identity. That won't happen. There will be no undercurrent, no buried girding of presence, no studies, no debates, not even a lightly fetishized nostalgic cultural performance. We were never near so relevant To say we were minor, too generous. To say we were obscure, too romantic. We were a secret kept obsessively amongst ourselves, nurtured in its separation from any and all actionable tests of influence, from any halting awkwardness of an initial attempt to overcome the insularity, which was, for us, extensive and ingrained. Our presence in public forums was often a peripheral curiosity. When we attempted to intervene, it was clumsy and obtuse. What passed from us to those we might have hoped to reach, to join with, ended up confusing them at best. We seemed hermetic, contradictory, an obstacle, obnoxious at the very least, and at most, a relatively determined hindrance. We annoyed those with whom we sought partnership, and for those we opposed, we were an afterthought, barely considered, a draft behind the organizational muster of more dedicated and canny formations, which we mocked regardless, 
often and at length, miming their grave mannerisms, making little voices that we use to imitate their arguments and describe their actions and beliefs, their naivete and smugness. We found them pitiable, despite our own failures, the smallness of our threats. But we had voices for those too. We had a whole vocabulary with which to acknowledge and ridicule our own failures and hypocrisies, to remind ourselves of them, and in that mindfulness, elevate them, we thought, from slight indictments of our own dysfunction into lucid acts of self-reflection, evocations of a personal honesty that excused for us our isolation, that it was good, that it confirmed our closeness to one another, We were friends, we thought, because we understood each other, because we understood the severity of this moment better than anyone, understood what it demanded and what it would take to follow that demand. In practice, this mostly meant getting drunk. We got drunk all the time. We got drunk and acted like total weirdos and overslept and often couldn't remember instructions to even the most basic of assignments, giving begrudgingly by whomever was putting up with us at that moment. We would sit around in a park and gossip delightfully for hours on end in between getting drunk and throwing up all over the place, on sidewalks and in the streets and on carpets, beds, couches, theater seats, in baskets of freshly washed linens set down innocently by our roommates, out of windows, into hallways, into our hands, into our friends' hands, on the train and on the bus and into the seat next to us on the bus and into the laps of the men sitting next to us on the bus and into our own laps while driving home, barely conscious, after a meeting where we lambasted that poor, sincere functionary with rambling descriptions of pet concepts and half-baked conspiracy theories, all utterly unrelated to the purpose of the meeting, while peppering our rants with dramatic calls for militancy and a severity of praxis well beyond the capabilities of nearly everyone present at the time, all of which was ignored. We were easy to ignore. We were easy to shuttle aside. Our enemies hated us, of course, but they didn't fear us. They saw us as eccentrics, to be smashed on principle, but unworthy of singling out. That would be distracting. They had more important things to take care of, more important targets to hone in on. So we lasted, skirting the edges of attention, disappearing into the background, even as things turned and the protests grew to skirmishes and the skirmishes grew more pitched, building in intensity until, as if it were the most natural thing, the fighting began in earnest, without reservation, outright and freely catastrophic. But even then, we were never a focus. There were always more visible affiliations, more vocal and active coteries driving forward into confrontation that it made sense to neutralize first. When our enemies can be bothered to direct their wrathful gaze towards us, they do so begrudgingly. They can barely be made to express even an exasperated yelp at having to waste their time on us this final errand. They sigh softly to themselves, knowing that they could be doing anything else. They could be anywhere else. They could be out at the movies, at a 10 a.m. showing of a second-run holiday comedy, or catching up on their favorite online streaming television series, or indulging in some hobby like amateur carpentry, or painting, or baking, or some obsessive exercise regimen like cycling, or CrossFit, or that mutter thing. They could be practicing with their mediocre classic rock cover band ahead of their monthly gig at the local bar and grill, playing for the same crowd of 12 or 15 people, mostly attending out of a sweet sense of obligation because it's too early for the bar to really get going in that quiet dimple of time between the usual rhythms of service, hazy and calm. Instead, they're out here scouring over charred refuse, 
craters and abandoned foxholes, sweating, the heat unrelenting, no breeze for hours, no rain or cool front coming, the stench unbearable and hardly abated by the makeshift face coverings they've fashioned out of torn sections of uniform or rags recovered from vacant homes, the blown out walls hiding messy protrusions of rebar or steep openings into basements or pits booby trapped with sharpened debris, husks of cars smoldering in the street. Behind each door, dwellings are recombined into smeared gatherings of waste, bodies sliding into rot, and then, hidden amongst them, the occasional remaining partisan, perhaps willing to detonate one last grenade or fire one last shot before being pulled out by their hair into the street by our enemies, who look up and briefly close their eyes, ears turned towards the sputtering cracks of skirmishes still sounding out in the distance. And yet it is fine. Their hearts are calm. Their breathing measured and assured. Their hands don't shake. Their hands, like their dreams, are still serene. Their memories, too, cling to their minds without turmoil, cleaned of shame, of fear, of regret. Because they know, they know this one true thing, which is that they've won. They know that they've won. They know that despite whatever horror or discomfort or pain or tragedy they might experience now or have experienced in the recent or distant past, despite whatever loss, to lose even their lives, their very existence made forfeit, their bodies blown open or apart, that it would make no difference. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't change a thing. The future is set. They own it. They hold it in their hands, in their mouths, in the cadence of their belief. No matter the upheavals that surround them now, that coat and bruise the world, the world for them is peaceful because it is theirs. For them, it sits whole and tranquil. It can no longer reflect the struggle of its making, can no longer hold the variance of possibility. Anything other than the serenity of their shape in the world to come, which, even in these last waning months of violence, when the world itself is turned over and torn apart, remains a promise to be kept no matter what in time. For them, this time is frozen, an unmoving shadow cast constantly in front of them. It is as if they aren't even here, as if the bullets leave not from the barrels of their rifles, but appear unbidden in the brains of their enemies, manifest there, not by choice, but by the pervasive logic of a reality that can no longer accommodate any other outcome that never could. So they sleep, they tie their shoes, the sky is unchanged. This is from begging. I only want ever for my enemies to be good. I only want ever for my enemies to be clear and known to themselves, to be steadfast in both mind and body, content in their emotional lives. I want them only ever to know the affection for the right people, the right things, to be on the side of justice, to push always against the worst impulses and devised obscenities of the world and to do so in the truest way possible. Let them fall from that in failure, not from their own weaknesses, known and understandable, but from strengths otherwise guaranteeing the fulfillment of every held hope and aspiration. Let them bear no fruit. Let their talents, dazzling and unprecedented, elicit only pity. Let every courageous deed immediately wane. Let their certainties meet only indifference. Take from them these satisfactions, but leave them their trueness, not as comfort, but as compulsion. Take from them their rest. Give them instead this incessant belief in a future that welcomes them. 
Give them the dream of a world in which their efforts make complete and absolute sense and in which they are rewarded for it, for their dedication, for their selfless will, for the sharpness of their insight and the direct continuation of that vision into actions both righteous and strategically sound. Let them imagine the warmest regards, the most impressed, respectful appreciation. Let them see progress in this way. Let them see history as a movement by which possibilities narrow down to their most refined appearance, by which decisions can be executed as an inevitably authentic self performing under the most informed counsel, models attuned in perfect harmony to the particularities of an overall experience of life that gets, in fact, better, more equitable, more fulfilling, easier, with a growing complexity unattached to pain or disappointment, a complexity that is only happiness, felt in wilder and more intricate ways, deepening. From this dream, let them know its worth. The world that awaits them, give them its quality in premonitions of elation and personal satisfaction, aspects attenuating the inhibited conditions of the present, causing them to distort and collapse, at least in momentary lapses, taking with them any inferred disagreements or dissatisfactions, leaving nothing, just contentment, like a breeze lifting the dull heat of doubt, giving respite from whatever challenges appear to question or imperil the certitude of one's cherished beliefs. Let every such blink from criticism be itself a proof, a confirmation whose mere possibility, even as fantasy, might bless its reflection in practice, offering a vision of fulfillment so vivid and compelling it eclipses any steps taken towards its realization. Let them imagine that any controversy they generate, any rebuke or disagreement, would not just be worth the risk of that rebuke, but would, by virtue of its function, escape the designation of risk entirely. In fact, the social and intellectual conditions necessary to produce controversy, to provoke a contested response, are precisely the conditions out of which the most trenchant modes of thought are possible. Their volatility is evidence. They are points of pressure against which the monumental presence, present with all of its atrocities can buckle. Give them this. Let them know it. Let them be unwavering. Let this belief be so fundamental to their thought as to find purchase in even the most common expressions of aesthetic preference of political advocacy. Let the body of its logic slip over their conversations, leading them toward anecdotes and explanatory propositions confirming again and again the same basic logical structure, so that arguments made in its favor seem not even to be that, an urging or position even to be made the focus of debate and proved within the passing back and forth of reason. They're inherent, rather, the stuff through which reason would, in fact, pass. In Empyrean, its undergirding of coherency so quiet and common as to be entirely free from the appearance of opinion. Let them speak only through this invisibility. As a rule, let its attractions seep into any developed sentiments, animating them with the burn of a supposedly absolute conviction. Give them this confidence. Give them clarity, its assuredness. Let them be prepared. Let them be ready to meet any opposition, any threat or difficulty with the steeled dignity of one who is good and right and is willing to follow that goodness to any end. Give them character to match that doggedness. Give them a buoyant, righteous heart. Give them humor. Give them a cool head and a firmness in conversation. Give them a beautiful physical life, attractiveness, fitness. Give them health seemingly unattached to the efforts associated with its maintenance. Let them experience every pleasure of life absented of harm. Let every drink of whiskey that passes through their lips make clear their thoughts and give strength and poise to their bodies. 
Let them eat the most beautiful, decadent foods, knowing that their metabolism will make short work of any vulgar elements, transforming all otherwise destructive impurities into vibrant, refreshing nutrients, making the vigorous physical exercise that comes actually easy to them even more efficient. Let them run fast. Let them perform difficult, involved choreographies without effort. Let them move in complex, graceful ways, making even the simple act of walking down the street or writing in a notepad or adjusting the position of a hat on their head for them a strange and compelling practice. Let them experience these things in ways far beyond our capacity. Give them access to feelings and knowledges hidden within even the most minute of daily activities. Let the world be for them always unfolding. And from this eternal condition of emergence, let them draw their hypotheses, observances, and artistic imagination. Make their ideas endlessly contemporary. Make their art real. Make their writing a joy. Make their explanations ringing and illuminative. And let me see all of this. Let me know it. I want to know the depth of their intelligence. I want to know the creativity required to pull those ideas from the world to give them form. Give me the sensitivity to realize these intricacies. Give me the presence of mind to unravel them. Give me a practice in thought that might, in the smallest way, grasp the blinding genius and originality of these accomplishments. Give me the love required to do this. Let my heart be open enough to them and strong enough in its own confidences that it could be shaken in this way and survive so that the awe of encountering such brilliance might not pitch it into small convulsions of fear and rage. Instead, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow larger to meet the generosity of the work presented to it. Let it grow large enough to wrap itself around their art and thus encounter it sincerely with a completeness unavailable to others, to anyone else. Give me this. Give it to me totally, the wonder of their art, of their person, of the way that the world works through them, of the gorgeousness of their personality. Let no one else see this. Let it be for me and me only. Let its power lay itself unadorned and uncompromising at the centermost organ of my attention. For everyone else, let it be shit. Let it be garbage. Let it be nonsense. But for me, let it be fascinating. Let it be resplendent so that when confronted with its dissolution, with its long, brutal collapse, with the vicious, embarrassingly public dismantling of its credibility, I can more wholly savor its end. For every moment of prodigal aptitude, of keen, inventive insight, let it shine as such for me while I watch it dragged across the forces of popular opinion as the worst example of repugnant self-flattery and worthless junk philosophizing. Every elegant formal move, let it inspire in me that warmth of recognition, the friendly delight that could give volume to a thousand sympathetic, sympathetic notes fluttering in my thoughts. But let it meet only the harshest evaluations from literally every other living person on the planet. As clearly as I can see its quality, let everyone else see the inverse. And yet, despite this extraordinary discrepancy, ensure that my opinion is in fact the correct one. Let me be right. Let me be on the right side. Let this correctness resonate deeply within myself. Let it guide me when I whisper kindly into the ears of my enemies. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, it's such oratory work, and it's really good to hear it. And it's good to listen with all of you. Um, for a couple of years now, Michael Gottlieb has very graciously entertained my eagerness to experience his work in performance, even through all of the various complications of time, collaboration, resource that a production involves. And I think I feel this other life around the work because the concerns of the poems are so social 
and relational. And I feel that, for, I feel that work formally in a choral way. Um, I notice the noticing, and it's special to follow in this new selected out from Chacks how this quality of perception in Michael Gottlieb's work has evolved over time. The early poems, syntactically, visually, are collaged with signage, overhearing, and remembering all of the speech matter that accumulates into an environment. Is a poem a world, or does it matter to the one we're in? I don't know, but the honesty of the question and the vulnerable openness to the possibility in this work invites me in, like finally finding someone at the party or the reading on your wavelength. Across experiments in sentence, line, list, and this book both presents and contextualizes that breadth, the poet's sensitivity to language remains vibrational. In the names of objects and people which form the dust, his long poem written after 9-11, and more recently in the lines of news which become the voices, we feel the devotion and lament of collection. I'm actually very grateful that we will be hearing and experiencing the poems tonight in the voice of Michael Gottlieb. It is, after all, his sensibilities, his idiosyncratic and passionate attention to the textures, people, and entanglements of speech, which have brought this generous and original work to us. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome him, Michael Gottlieb, to the Poetry Project. Thank you, Kyle. And thank you, Joseph. This is a great book. I paid for this copy myself. But she didn't sign it, though. I don't know what that means. Thank you, Kyle, for those kind words. By popular acclaim, one of us has been elected outlier for life. On our chosen path, making our puissant approach, hexing the prey, our passage tangled in our own discomforts, all of us so greatly relieved by the backdated mourning. We've come to believe that Despite the prop wash, we'd apparently escaped quite nearly unmust. So we had no trouble shorting what was ever left of our residual, demissible, dry eyed pudour, leaving us entirely disarmed in the face of just this sort of eventuality. That is, ourselves showing up. Uh, that was from a book called Lost and Found, published in 2003 by Roof Books. I'm going to be skipping around in this book. This is from another book that Roof published in 2003 in 1999 called Gorgeous Plunge. What doesn't kill us makes us weaker. Across the sky, a, a, a missing man formation. Like that untoward ardor for precedence, that way of styling oneself, those illiberal disaffections, all speaking so poorly for our powers of abeyance, inference, investiture, endurance. In this lattice of derision, a ragtag, uh, nattered remainder calumnied, unweighted, 
They are waiting here. The company entire. That is not really us, we say. Just because it's in my car doesn't mean it's mine. The unnumbered lot, the waste plot, the stringently curious applying the barmicide, administering the drubbing anew. The whirling disease. Not enough, never nearly enough of the merry men, the past masters. They were here just a minute ago. This can kill you too, just as easily. Too much poetry. Poetry can be bad for your health. The ones dragged along, driven off, ridden to exhaustion, to distraction, to all ends, driven down, withering under the pitying exposure. Do not shake. The appalling results, the old fashions, the Manhattans, the last of the Delawares, the trophies and the captives here on the northern branch, along with the fragiles and the rushes and the ground rates, raised, that is, organized, fully subscribed, like a hopeful faded regiment, at first sight, at first publication. Point away from face and other people while opening. We become our lists. This is not your city. You mean the queen really is in the pay of the Trilateral Commission? It gets walked on less. That's why my carpet looks better than I do. There is another city, a shadow city. It is right here cohabiting the same streets and buildings as the one we think we live in. Most of us, most of the time, have not the slightest clue to its existence. An invisible city before our very eyes. Several cities, a multitude, more than any one of us can know. He often told me that he preferred to avoid presenting his friends, his literary friends, that is, with the opportunity to read his work before it was published. Speaking of New York Times Magazine. In this context, he gave free reign, to me at least, to the suspicion that he was coming across phrases and not, in, and not infrequently entire lines of his in his friend's writing. Eventually, though, he grew to recognize how misplaced was such a concern. Now, he confided recently, he strives to keep them from knowing what he is reading. These, these are sections from a, a book called New York that, that the figures of Jeff Young published in 1993. The Great Closer, True North, precisely where we did not expect to find them, especially in those numbers spilling forward, widening to fill the enclosure, as if one body could not be expected to hold so much onto the bay's floodplain. Bearing the simple legend, enlarged to show detail, tattooed on his derangeatois, Glad rations, the consulting celerity, the self-selecting kitchen crew, in our espaliered avenues, the memory of what we never quite gained falls to the unrate gravamen. Our dirty little secret, the poet's 
Ephesians just use kiosk. Their garden deity, the eponymous Haspel Lemley, an ornament of a profession that had divested itself of decoration. When I told my parents what I wanted to be, my father threw the classified section at me. Show me where it says help wanted poet. I have to say that it's, 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 it's pretty uh, intense to be here uh, reading here after all this time, um, the, the first reading that I've given that wasn't in front of a camera in almost two years, and to be reading here in front of people, it's um, this place that I, that's been part of my life, you know, for my whole life as a poet. This is also from Gorgeous Plunge. The people have not spoken. They have nothing to say. Or perhaps they're too busy to get back to us. Likewise, by now, we must be alive to the suggestion that he is, in fact, dead. Or should be, by all rights. The one time he was one with the world was when he was doing the one thing the world could have cared less about. It's what makes us no good for anything else. Chance has nothing whatsoever to do with it, with these sallow, coruscating, sheepishly bilious delectations. The funhouse mirror, the guttering lamp, a wail of obeisance rising from the dark. We hear it in the swelling. The problem with only liking that and those that like you back. If you keep scratching it, it will bleed. This is the grove. This is the glade. This is the place where they took the best part of us away. In every way that there must for every buyer a seller be, you cannot rise without my falling. And so when you go to sleep, you will see me holding your hand. Death or the booby hatch. That's the choice according to Nick Piambino. The victims of this knowledge with their unsecuritized affirmations, their skin, a kind of outerwear, shrunk, lines pulled like a wrapper, scarred with decline verbs, the kind we don't, we don't care to escape from our lips. This is what that life provides you. Those teeth in the head, that cough if you're lucky. This great predicate giving way to a sublunary subjunctive. This pondering weight, a plumage in service of these familiar horrors, rising hereabouts. It's not that there are none so bad, it's just that there are so many of them. Then there are the other ones who rise. Our portion control, our job to abandon all hope. True humility, the most uncompromising in the arsenal. We do not rise to that occasion. As if making it new makes us old and so in the end kills us. We die so others can be free to ignore us.
This is from another roof book called Mostly Clearing. That was published in 2019. We pass along the fiery road, a kind of set list stapled to the articles of faith. The green shoots too. A salubrious uptick, a scenic overlook, an unspooling hinterland, a push in of hopefulness pouring us into these casts. We know if there is no deposit, maybe there is no return. Not heedless, but regardless. Tonight, while we speak from a moonless sky, men are dropping onto France. The mantle of hills, the practice vanishing point, me along with the rest agape, looking upon those frozen eddies, beholding the incommensurable strung like beads, the signature effect, which is to be clear. I didn't know what to say. I was a hired hand, if you will. I wanted to be the architect of all this glad rain, issuing my own paper, a boom service. Don't you wonder why I'm always so glad to see you? I wanted to believe I really didn't need all that chrome. What all these disparate wants have in common what I found in myself, discovered in a, a box lot, a keepsake, showing me the lay of the land, a theater of operations, a kind of assay office, presided over by an end stage door Johnny. What the market did so well, My naked asservation balled up like a fist. Even for me, all of this might otherwise have seemed a bit on the nose or a, a sop to my self-regard, like a, a press gang of my peers. It was by design. It was quite the night. It was arrayed for me. Rolling hills and dales, all picked out by the, by the occasional comet arcing across a winking valley. Put me in, coach, I'm ready. Um, and I'm gonna read a, a bit from this poem Kyle mentioned called The Voices, which is the one new poem in, in, in in, in this book that hasn't been published before. Um, it's a long poem. I'm just going to read bits from the, the beginning, middle, and end. Um, and uh, it was uh, prompted by an uh, uh, email from him last, a year ago last spring. And uh, this email, a portion of which, a portion of it forms the epigraph for this poem. And that reads The morning dove and the ambulance siren wail in and out of one another all day. And I'll close with this poem. Mr. Petrocelli walked nearly every morning to 7.30 Mass. He walked everywhere, in fact, holding his rosary beads of green Connemara marble. That is, when he wasn't nurturing his gardens, fruits, and vegetables, which he would often give away. Sometimes he gave away the entire plant. He began to feel uncharacteristically fatigued in mid-March, declined over the next two weeks, and died at Staten Island Hospital's South Campus. In addition to his wife and son, Mr. Petrocelli is survived by two granddaughters. A week after his death, 
His wife was continuing to receive messages from the many people her husband had touched. I have his strawberry plants, they say. I have his fig trees. For many New Yorkers, it's officially springtime in New York City when magnolia trees in Central Park are in bloom. This year, star magnolias first bloomed in Central Park during the second week of March. Passerines start coming through in March with the first push of hardy birds like American robins, common grackles, and red-winged blackbirds. We are not handmaidens or angels. All trauma is preverbal. I'm the float nurse. It moves me to see her wallet, her planner, her toiletries. Only a week ago, she was a person with a future with plans with cherry-flavored lip balm. I had a little bird. Its name was Enza. I opened the window and in flew Enza. Tulip season peaks around late April to early May, adding pops of color along our walkways as spring turns into summer. You can find house sparrows in most places where there are houses or other buildings and few places where there aren't. Everybody is scared. You can see it in people's eyes. The customers are scared of us delivery boys. When I wake up every day, I tell God, God, please take care of me. I saw an Amazon driver pull up with his entire family in the car. The last day Gary Washington reported to work at New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital in northern Manhattan was March 29th. His body was aching, and a colleague saw him lying down in the cafeteria. Rosalind Washington, his wife, thought he was growing too old to keep working as a housekeeping employee there. He cleaned the rooms of virus patients after they were discharged, and his brother thought he should stop going to work, she said. So many housekeepers called out sick that the hospital began bringing in temporary workers, one of his colleagues said. But Mr. Washington was the family's primary breadwinner. He was not going to quit his job and not take care of his family, Mrs. Washington said. I had 25 years with this man. I'm so empty. Now I'm getting calls about widow's benefits, she said, her voice breaking. He's trying to take care of me still. Even after her mother died, Manoli still texted trying to stay connected. I miss you, she wrote before going to bed that night. When she woke the next morning, Manoli texted, thank you for coming to me last night in my dreams. But what I miss most, with almost an, a lacerating intensity, are New York City bars. I miss all the bars where you can feel the subway above or below, the sense of the city chugging along. In this precarious moment, the bars I find myself missing most are those that transport me to the past, to the New York City of 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or more bars that endured three or four wars, prohibition in the Great Depression, and four to city drop dead. Bars that endure the Spanish flu and thus seem to promise to whisper a promise to me that they'll endure this too. I'm just as likely to die from a cop as I am from COVID, he said. I do not think that anybody is going to be observing this curfew, said George Daratini, 34. It doesn't compute for New York City to have a closing time. I had an experience where I asked a group of officers why they weren't wearing masks, Ms. Heckard said, and they told me it was because they couldn't breathe, and I thought that was the most ironic thing. 
Today, the mourning dove holds the distinction of being the only Native American bird to breed in every state, including Hawaii. Their U.S. population is estimated at more than 400 million. Despite their numbers, their lives tend to be short and difficult. He was old enough to remember when there were no spitting signs in the subways. Load the sled, check the traces, feed Balto. I am one of the lucky ones. I never needed a ventilator. I survive. But 27 days later, I still have lingering pneumonia. I use two inhalers twice a day. I can't walk more than a few blocks without stopping. When I was at my sickest, I could barely talk on the phone. I'd like to say that I caught up on my reading, but I didn't. Instead, I closed my eyes and I saw myself running along the New York waterfront, healthy and whole, all eight and a half million of my neighbors by my side. I pictured myself doing the things I haven't gotten to do yet, like getting married, buying a house, becoming a mother, owning a dog. My kids, I miss their touch, their smell, their drool, their runny noses. We will miss Easter, my birthday, and all likelihood the baby's first birthday. I am angry at a force I cannot see, but more than anything, I am sad and aching to squeeze them again, to feel their soft skin next to mine. When this nightmare is over, I will hold them so long my arms will ache and the kids will fall to my feet and hug my ankles like they used to before we were all felled by this monster in our midst. Sounds of children yelling, applause, car horns, rattles, cacophony, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, pots banging, trumpets, crescendo. Thank you. very uh, intense to be in the time of that work in this time with you. Um, thank you to both Joseph and Michael, and let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. And thank you for being here and for listening. Our next events are tomorrow online. We have a lecture with Anne Anne Lauterbach, That Various Field, um, which will be a talk on history and time and the past. And then uh, on Wednesday, October 13th, also online, we have a reading with Rosemary Waldrop and Wendy Sue. So I hope that we'll see you at some event soon over Zoom or in this room. And um, please stick around outside in the churchyard. We have books for sale and wine, and we'll have a little reception. Thank you. <laughs>